وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين الذين قال عنهم الرسول اللهم إن هؤلاء أهل بيتي وخاصتي وحامتي لحمهم لحمي ودمهم دمي يؤلمني ما يؤلمهم ويحزنني ما يحزنهم أنا حرب لمن حاربهم وسلم لمن سالمهم وعدو لمن عاداهم ومحب لمن أحبهم إنهم مني وأنا منهم فاجعل صلواتك وبركاتك ورحمتك وغفرانك ورضوانك علي وعليهم وأذهب عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات أولئك هم خير البرية جزاؤهم عند ربهم جنات عدن تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها أبدا رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls the enlightenment of the hearts the acceptance of the deeds and for the hastening of the reappearance of Baqiyatillahi al-A'zam Ruhi wa arwahu al-Alameen alahu al-Fida Enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad My dear respected sisters, scholars, elders, brothers Salamun alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh it is very common in this day and age when we buy a product or receive a service, we get a satisfaction guarantee. Meaning, many a times, you'll be told that if you're not happy with this item or this product, there is a time frame by which you can return or, for example, get a different product or obtain a refund. In this day and age, many of the services, many of the consumer-led society promises are based on this satisfaction guarantee and we have become used to this but there are people today who have come with their very important realization that does not need a phd or it's not rocket science that human beings are very difficult to satisfy there are those who will be easily unhappy about many things they will not be satisfied with many of the items or the products perhaps that they buy and that's why there is a famous arab proverb that says that the satisfaction of human beings is a goal that will never be achieved. Yet at the same time, this is something that many of the prophets and those who came to deliver a message of the prophets sought to establish. In other words, in a world today that is driven by the greed and the desire to seek the attention of others and the approval of others on social media, I want, for example, due to peer pressure, others to be happy with me, others to approve what I do, I want to fit in. Prophets came forward with the message that, by the way, you're wasting your time, that you will not be able to attain the satisfaction of human beings. One day they're for you, next day they're against you. Luqman al-Hakim said this to his son. His son said, very well, show me. Show me through practical ways. How do people not become somehow satisfied with us? He said, very well. You've heard this story famously that he would continue on a journey with his son. With them, they have a mule, a donkey. Once they enter a village, Luqman is riding a, the donkey and the son is walking next to him. In other words, he's not riding. All of a sudden, the people of that village say, that's not fair. Why is the father on the donkey and the son is walking? That's disrespectful to the elder. So he comes down. Now the son is on the animal. They go to a different village. There are a group of people who turn and say, that is not what? That is not a good idea. Why? Because, in other words, the, the elder should be an individual who is riding, not the son. Now they decide that none of them ride the donkey. They walk and they just pull the animal. The third village they go to, what do they say? Israf. This donkey, nobody's riding it. So what's going on? Why are these two walking? The fourth place they go to, they decide to do what? The only fourth mathematical possibility, which is both of them on it, on the animal. Even at that time, there were the animal rights groups. 
They cried foul and said, listen, how can two people ride the donkey? This is too much for the animal. So Luqman looked at his son and said, listen, we tried four different possibilities. We couldn't get people to be happy with us. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, therefore, through the message of the prophets has said that the satisfaction of the people should not be our goal. There should be something else which is seeking the pleasure and the river of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. That's what we should be looking for. In other words, as long as Rabb al is pleased with me, I'm not really, I shouldn't be worried if the others are not necessarily happy. And this concept is beautiful, it's life-changing, it's transformational. Why? Because when we recite Dua'i Kumail, this mesmerizing supplication, that's a true gift from Allah wa ta'ala through the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum salam there is a line at the end which most of us recite and are very happy to recite it. What's that line? Ya Sari al riva Ya Allah, you're very quick to be pleased with us. Very easy or we are able to attain Allah wa ta'ala's pleasure in a quick manner question that we have to ask today is this subject is very relevant in the world that we live in today but especially this evening as we celebrate the auspicious wilada of an individual who attained the title related to this subject this subject that has been mentioned 73 times in the holy quran the satisfaction of Allah, the river of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the man is the eighth holy imam, the tenth individual from the ship of salvation, and that's the Ahl al-Bayt, Ali ibn Musa al-Rida, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. This great holy individual has this title, but doesn't mean others do not also share the same title. What do we mean? When I say Imam al-Sadiq has this title, the truthful one. When I say al-Sajjad, the fourth one, is the prostration, prostrating one. When I say al-Jawad, is the magnanimous one. It doesn't mean that the rest of the Imams don't share this quality. Why? Because these Imams were known by these attributes due to their dedication and what they stood out for. In other words, the people at that time saw this and perhaps it was also sometimes a title given to them by the Holy Prophet of Islam and passed on from Allah wa ta'ala. Imam Al-Kadhim is also Rida. Imam Al-Baqir is also Sajjad. Imam Al-Sadiq is also Hadi. No doubt about that. Each and every of the Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt share these amazing qualities. But the eighth Holy Imam is given this beautiful title. And this title should be inspirational for you and I. Many a times when we come to the lives of the Imams alayhum I ask you this question because I've done this with many communities, blessed communities I've been with, friends, those who are blessed to be taking part in these gatherings which you should never ever underestimate the power of. You know, if I was to ask you this question that Imam al-Sadiq asked one of his companions or people walking with him, Imam asked him, what's the greatest blessing Allah has given you? What is it? Some of you will say, my wealth. Some will say my health. Some will say my family. Some will say security. Some will say the ability to live, for example. Yes? This man would say the same thing. Imam Ali salam said, these are all great, but there is something greater. Quran tells us it's greater. He says, what do you mean, Abu Rasulullah? He says, read in the Quran, Allah says in Surah Al-Duha, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ Speak to people about one favor of Allah. Those of you who know Arabic know that the Arabic for ni'mah or for blessings is ni'mah. The plural is ni'am. Allah Jalla wa Ala, He is saying, there is one favor I need you to speak to people about and be proud of. Which is what? Imam Ali Salam asks this individual, if there is one favor that's greater than everything else, what is it? The man said, Allah wa Rasuluhu a'lam. I don't know. Allah and his messenger knows. Tells, tell me, Abna Rasulullah. Imam said, Have you not read the Quran? The answer is in the Quran. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Al Yawm. Akmaltu lakum deenakum. Wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati. Today I have completed the religion and perfected the ni'mah of Allah, the blessing, the grace of Rabbul Alameen. So he looks towards this man and says, this ni'mah that Allah says, speak to people about, which is the greatest blessing we should be happy about, is the wilaya of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. But I ask you, this great blessing that I should be grateful to Allah for, what do we mean? 
When I wake up in the morning here in Oslo, anywhere else around the world, and I see the sun, I say, subhanAllah, mashallah, it's a lovely day. I'm feeling happy. Alhamdulillah. Or I get good news, promotion, or I have great grades in my university exams, or I'm about to get married, or any positive news that comes to me, right? I'm usually express, expressive of gratitude to Allah. How many times did you wake up in the morning and immediately realized this unbelievable, powerful state that we're in? Alhamdulillah. الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية أمير المؤمنين that I should be a, an individual who's so happy and proud to have been chosen by Allah to follow صراط المستقيم to follow this righteous path the path of salvation of the ولاية of the أهل البيت عليهم السلام but with this comes terms and conditions right the Imam الرضا عليه السلام says بشرطها وشروطها in the famous tradition uh, that is what the golden tradition but what one of them is what? When I ask people and tell them, you are celebrating Wiladat Imam al Rida alayhi salam today. Or when we celebrate Imam al Hadi alayhi salam's Wilada. Or for example, Imam al Sajjad. Or commemorate the Shahada. Give me one hadith from an Imam, from that Imam. There are some people who stare, say, I don't know. They'll say, What? what? A hadith? I don't know. I'll tell you a bit about his life. I know a story, but I'm struggling with a hadith. If you and I are not able to disseminate and spread the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt, then who will? Someone came to Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam and Imam said to him, Atajlusuna wa tatahaddathoon? Do you gather and talk about us? He said, Bala ya ibn Rasulillah. Of course we do. He says, Inni wallahu uhibbu tilkal majalis. I love what you do. Where you're gathered to remember our virtues and our excellence. Then he says, Ahyu amrana, rahimallahu man ahya amrana. Revive our affairs. May Allah revive the hearts of those who revive our affairs. The man says, Yabna Rasulullah, how do we do it? I don't know. Teach us. Tell us. He says, Tata'allamuna ulumana, thumma tu'allimuna han nas. You, you learn our knowledge. Then you teach it to the people. Fa inna nasa law alimu, mahasina kalamina let tabauna. If people were to know our teachings, they would automatically follow us. So one of the key things when we gather to celebrate is to walk through the door and to get home and to say, you know what? I'm going to make a note. Most of us don't have a habit of writing things. Most of us listen passively. I listen to a majlis in the car or in Muharram, Ramadan. MashaAllah, we have a record of thousands of majalis. And you know, a barometer for a successful Muharram or Ramadan or Wilad or anything that I usually have is I ask people, how is the majlis? Oh, Maulana, it was amazing. Out of this world majlis. I say, really? Tell me one thing you remember from it. Well, I don't know. You don't remember anything from the majlis? I remember it was amazing. I felt good. Mashallah. You feeling good? Great. You can do that by having a cheesecake or a Nutella sandwich. But when you come to the, to the celebration or to the commemoration of an imam, not only should you be feeling good, you should be enriched and inspired. You should be illuminated. You should be closer to Allah. Wa if you're not, then there's an issue. Most of the times it's an issue with us. Not necessarily the speaker. Many of the speakers try to disseminate the uloom. But am I writing these hadiths down? Am I documenting them? After 30, 40 years of attending lectures, I should have books of stories and narrations of the imams that I can disseminate and teach and inspire the children and the generations and the Norwegian people and the rest of the world. Do I do that? Not really, because I'm a bit lazy. I'm more concerned about watching hours of feeds on my Instagram and I think at the end of the day, there is a reminder for us in this regard. And that's why I'd like to take you on a journey in the next few minutes. This journey involves recognizing a hadith from the imam that we should remember, but related to this very important, pivotal state of seeking the pleasure of Allah. Tabaraka wa ta'ala, rida of Allah. Why is Imam al-Rida alayhi salam known as by this title? How do we get Allah's pleasure? I want Allah to be pleased with me, right? How do I get it? And if I was to ask many, they'll say, yeah, do what Allah has pleased, uh, Allah wants us to do, and inshallah we'll get the, his pleasure. That's a simple answer. There are more details from the Quran. Let me take you through this, because sometimes what happens is we come across passages in the Quran and in hadith and in dua literature, which we do not understand. And many a times these extracts and these points are trying to lead us towards this realization. What do we mean? I remember once reading a story that a couple who were going on their honeymoon went to Dubai 
and they were walking in the streets. When they were walking in the streets, they saw a car showroom. And the husband said to his wife, I want to see these cars. She said, okay, bismillah. They went inside. He said to the car salesman, can you tell me, is there any special cars? He said, yes. There is a car that's just arrived today. It's only for Muslims. It doesn't work for anyone else. He says, why? He says, because it's known as the dhikr car. Whatever you mention dhikr, it works. He said, subhanAllah, that's a nice car. Can we test drive it? He said, yes. But I have to remember the instructions. He said, okay, tell me the instructions. He said, if you want to, to make it start the ignition, it does not have keys. It doesn't have a button. You need to say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It will start. It recognizes your voice. Okay. Now, if you want it to move a bit further, you say, Alhamdulillah. And if you want it to say, accelerate, so not just move, you say, La ilaha illallah. If you want it to stop, there's no brakes. You need to say, Subhanallah. And he gave him a few directions through dhikr. This man said, that's easy. I know these like a car, no problem. Him and his wife jump in the car. They say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. They say, Alhamdulillah. And the car drives. It's cruise control. Now they're driving in Dubai. Now they're enjoying. They say, let's go out. They go out in the deserts outside the city. Now they're resting, talking. The car is driving on a normal speed. It's been a while, half an hour, 40 minutes. Now they see a sign. They're saying road is closed because there is a bridge and the bridge is what? Is uh, faulty. So it's broken. So you need to turn. Take another road. Now he needs to stop the car. He can't remember what to say. So he looks at his wife and he says, do you remember what I need to say to stop the car? She says, I don't know. And by the way, in between brackets, lots of problems between husband and wife happens during driving. Because the wife is saying, don't do this. And the husband say, don't tell me what to do with this and turn this way and whatever, right? So there needs to be some courses on how to manage marital relationships whilst driving only. There needs to be something done. At, the, at that time, they're panicking, not knowing what to do. They passed the sign. They could see that there is what? A bridge. And they could see that what? They need to stop the car, but they can't do it. They don't have reception to call on their phone. Now they're panicking. Now he goes through every dhikr that he knows, but he does not remember. Subhanallah. All of a sudden, just before the end where the car is supposed to fall, he cries out, Subhanallah, the car stops right at the edge. He looks at his wife, smiles, and says, Alhamdulillah. The idea is, if I knew these adhkar, these duas, these supplications, what they mean, they are not forgotten. They're not necessarily something at the tip of my tongue only. There's something in my heart. That's why when I look at Imam al-Rida alayhi salam, there is a beautiful hadith from him that I'd like to share with you that he invites us to reflect upon. This hadith is something that invites us to take this journey. He says, Inna al-ibadata ala sab'ina wajha. The worship of Allah is based on 70 stages or 70 steps or 70 parts. فَتِسْعَةٌ وَسِتُّونَ مِنْهَا 69 of this steps is in one thing. فِي الرِّضَى وَالتَّسْلِيمِ لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِأُلِي الْأَمْرِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ Interesting. Imam Ali Salam says the worship of Allah is based on a number of important steps. But the vast majority, 98 or 97 percent, is based on this notion of Allah's pleasure and submission and surrender to Him. And in order for me to understand this, I'd like to invite you to reflect upon the fact that we as the followers of Ahl al-Bayt are already, alhamdulillah, in an advanced state in seeking the pleasure of Allah. You say to me, what's the proof from the Quran? In Surah Al-Bayyinah, Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ Those who are righteous and do good deeds are the best. What is their reward? جَزَاؤُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ جَنَّاتُ عَدْنٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا But Allah says we will promise paradise for them underneath which rivers flow. They will remain there forever. رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ 
Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah. The Prophet of Islam, Al Rasul Al A'zam, Wa Nabi Al Akram, Al Mustafa, Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sallam. Allahumma Salli Ala Muhammad Wa Ali Muhammad. Is asked, where, where are the sources? The sources are important. Allah Mahafiz Jalal al Din al Suyuti, Durr al Manthur, which is a famous book of commentary of our brothers, and he's a Shafi'i. Number one. Number two, Tabari's Tafsir, very well known heavyweight in the world of Muslims as far as commentary of the Quran is concerned. Al-Hakam al-Hasakani, Shawahid al-Tanzil, great book in terms of explaining the reasons for the revelation. They all say the Prophet was asked, Ya Rasulullah, please tell us who are the ones Allah is pleased with them and they are happy with Allah. Who are they? If you go to a website, www.l-islam.com not .org .org is a Shia organization great website .com is the website that is run by whom? by the organization that I call enjoining the evil and forbidding the good in that land yes? in that land they say yeah, they put this ayah you go to this ayah Surah al bayyinah and you click on it Tafsir underneath which they have narrated this the Rawaya says what? The Prophet of Islam said, Ya Ali, hum anta wa shi'atuka yawm al-qiyamati radhina mardiyin. Ya Ali, these people are you and your Shia. They, you are pleased with Allah and Allah is pleased with you. This is a beautiful promise and a wonderful statement from the Holy Prophet of Islam. Yes? Now, if this is given, there is a need to seek that path now. There is a need to understand what am I supposed to do in order for me to attain this river from Rabbil Alameen. It's simple to state, but it needs your attention for the next few minutes because I'll be as practical as possible in this regard. Number one, it involves two things. It involves we being pleased with Rabbil Alameen and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore will be pleased with us great are we not happy with Allah am I not pleased with him you all may say yes I am I will testify that I am happy with Allah I can prove to you the majority of Muslims are not difficult statement huh to prove let me show you some evidence Alhamdulillah for what's happening in Gaza. Alhamdulillah, 65,000 people died in an earthquake in Turkey and Syria last year. Alhamdulillah for COVID-19. Alhamdulillah for Karbala and Ashura. What's going through your mind now? When I say, are you okay to somebody? They say, Alhamdulillah. Usually, Alhamdulillah is an expression to say it was good. It was all right. It's fine. Yes? When I said, Alhamdulillah, for the devastation and the suffering of our brothers and sisters, mercilessly butchered in Palestine and Gaza, you're thinking, should I be saying Alhamdulillah for this? Surely I should reject this and be angry about it. Why am I grateful to Allah for it? Why? What's going on here? How many times in your life you've gone through a pain, suffering, hardship, trial, calamity, and you've said, Yo, oh Lord, why me? Why are you putting me through this? Or you've been asking Allah for something. You've gone to the Kaaba, you've gone to holy sites, you've begged and begged, nothing. And you're saying, Ya Allah, but why? Why are you not giving it to me? How many times when it's so difficult here in Oslo to fast in the month of Ramadan? By the way, I don't know how you do it, but great credit to everyone. When the iftar is at 11.30 and fajr is at 1.30, mashallah. If you are steadfast, you have a special place in Jannah, inshallah. But there are people in here, or even, by the way, we in the UK are not that far from you in that time. 9.30, iftar and about two o'clock Fajr. So we're not that far from you. Maybe a less daraja in Jannah. But let me ask you this question. 
Someone who is a non-Muslim Norwegian comes to you and says, how can you be fasting so long? Do you look at them and say, this is amazing, it's the best, I love it, or they say, tell me about it. It's so hard. But I'm getting on, you know. There's a whole world, there's a gulf of difference in these answers. What do we mean? Am I pleased with Allah's laws and legislations? That's the first level. Let's discuss this. What do we mean? Two things I need to be pleased with in order to be pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the motto of whom? Of these holy individuals, the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. Remember this dua which changes lives if you understand it. What is this dua? Of Amir al Mu'mineen wa Mawla al Muttaqeen, salamullahi alayhi. What an amazing dua. Wallah, if you know it and, and appreciate and recite it, it will change your life. Ilahi kafani fakhran an akuna laka abda wa kafani izzan an takuna liya rabba an takama uhib fajani kama tuhib. Ya Allah, it fills me with pride that you are my Lord. And it fills me with what? It fills me with strength and dignity that I am your servant. You are exactly how I want you to be. So make me how you want me to be. What words? Mesmerizing. These people we don't just follow because our parents told us. There's no one like them. These holy 14. Yes? Now, when this holy man says that, Ya Allah, I love you no matter what, I need to understand these two branches. Please focus on this. The first is, I need to be delighted, happy, satisfied. In order to attain the station of Riva, I need to accept and surrender and be willing to be praising God's laws. Meaning what? Meaning what? Let me give you an example. I am surrounded by people who tell me, for example, that some Islamic laws are patriarchal. Some are anti-women. I don't understand why, for example, for instance, a particular law says that women aren't allowed to do something and men are. For example, yes. Or I don't understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made something obligatory and something not. Many a times we struggle with these. Yes. One level is for me to do it whilst my heart is at an ease. One level is, for, you know what, I'll just do it. Because at the end of the day, I know I'll be punished if I don't do it. There is another level that says, I trust and love God so much, and I'm pleased with Him so much, that whatever He says, I'm going to embrace, and I'm going to do wholeheartedly. So whatever He makes obligatory, I believe in, and I'm not going to allow anybody to shake my iman on it. I'm not going to let any person doubt, make me doubt about it. Because he's my Lord and I have to be pleased with him. If I want him to be pleased with me, I need to be pleased with him. I ask you, when Allah places all these laws, when he makes something halal and haram, is it for our benefit or for his benefit? 100% for our benefit. Do you agree? Yes? It's all for us. Ya ayyuhan nas, antumul fuqarao ila Allah. Wallahu wal ghaniyun hamid. In yashak yudhibkum wa yati bi khalqin jadeed. Allah says, don't think that I benefit nothing. I am the rich, you are the poor. You need me, I don't need you. So when he's made things wajib, it's for our own benefit. Do we trust him or do we constantly object? For example, I get calls. I'm sure ulama, other scholars, they get these calls. Maulana, is there a loophole for khums, please? I don't want to pay. Tell me a trick so I don't pay. Right? That's one problem. Another problem is when I let movements and isms affect my iman and yaqeen in Allah and my religion. Meaning what? Liberalism, feminism, extremism, all these things. I'll give you an example. In America, a few years ago, I was sitting in a mosque, in a, in a center, by followers of Ahl al-Bayt. A brother came to me and said, you know, my daughter has asked every alim for the past four years the same question, and she has not got a satisfactory answer. She will go on to ask you the same question tomorrow in the Q&A. I said, subhanallah, is it that deep that no one has been able to answer this question? He said, yeah, and God help you. I said, subhanallah. That night, I said, I, وسلم أمري لله. Whatever happens tomorrow, let it happen. We try. Next day, she was sitting in like this in the Q&A. She put her hands up. She's about 14, 15. 
She said to me, I have asked every scholar, every visiting alim, every person, and they have not been able to answer me. So I said, Bismillah, help me. Tell me, what's the question? She said, why is Allah made hijab wajib for women and not for men? Now there's the classic answer. Do you know what the classic answer is? That she's been receiving for four years. Do you know what the classic answer is? Women, their hair is a cause of attraction. And so they need to cover it so they don't attract. But I knew if I give her that answer, she'll say, wait, some men have also attractive hair. So that's not fair. Surely those men who have attractive hair should also wear hijab. Or they all become like us and wear turbans. Yes? I didn't answer this question. I said to her sister, I have the answer for you that I guarantee you, you'll be happy and satisfied. She stood up, said, really? Subhanallah, please, please, what is it? I said, nothing is free in this world. She said, what do you mean? I said, you give me the answer to my question and I will give you the answer to your question. Do we have a deal? She said, we have a deal. I said to her, my question or yours first? She said, okay, you ask. I said, explain to me and give me evidence why Salatul Maghrib is three rak'ah and Fajr is two. She looked. She said, that's not fair. I said, why? She said, because there's no reason. Allah made it this way. I looked at her and smiled. I said, the answer to your question is, Allah made it this way. Khalas. Oh, but hold on. That's sheep. That's not this. That's a robot. No, 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 no. No, no. no. There is a power of taslim. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Fala wa rabbika la yu'minun. Allah swears by himself. He says, by me, by God, you are not a believer. You're not a mu'min, a Muslim. Until the Prophet is made an arbiter who judges. Then they're not unhappy in themselves when it comes to the result of what you rule. That's one. But the most important part is the following. They submit wholeheartedly, fully. Meaning what? Meaning when I don't understand why something is wajib, do I need proof in order to practice it? Or should I be an individual who believes in Allah and say, Ya Rabbi, my brain cannot comprehend, but my heart is connected to you. My aql is telling me I need evidence, but my heart, because it's in love with you, I will do it wholeheartedly. There's no harm, by the way, when it comes to fiqh, to ask just for inquisitive purposes. Where's the dalil? Can we see riwayat? Okay. If you are at the level where you want to study the different narrations and sometimes how the faqih comes to a conclusion, brilliant. Just for your own information, not for the purposes of accepting an act and doing it or not. There's two things here. You've signed a contract with Allah. Yes? You've signed a contract, which means what? That I am a Muslim, I surrender. Why does Imam Rida say 69 out of 70 of ibadah is to surrender and be pleased with Allah? Because once you've reached this, you've reached. Once you've grasped this, you've grasped. Once you've attained it, you're successful. The moment you have encapsulated your heart with the submission to Allah to believe and to submit and surrender and to say whatever he asks and wants me to do, I will do. No one's going to shake my aqidah and belief. No one. That's the first. So when it comes to halal and haram, that's the first area. The second area, which I will conclude with, but it's the most difficult. It's when I am happy with whatever he makes me go through and whatever he takes away from me. Whatever he gives and whatever he takes. And please focus on the example that I'm about to give you because it's a difficult example. People have left Islam because of this example come out with a few strange sentences today but it's true because I've dealt with people who have said I cannot explain this story in the Quran which is what which is Musa and Khidr when Khidr kills a young boy who is innocent Khidr Muslim Sunni and Shia I believe most of them that he is a prophet Khidr Quran praises him Khidr is what? Is somebody whom Allah is happy with. 
Therefore, the Quran mentions the story where Musa is outraged when Khidr takes a young boy who is playing with the children in a corner and kills him. أَقَتَلْتَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسِ لَقَدْ جِئْتَ شَيْئًا نُكْرَى Musa says to Khidr, what are you doing? This is an innocent boy. I ask you, please. Now you're walking anywhere, anywhere in the world. You see somebody who takes a young child and kills him. What do you think about that child, the person? Murderer, killer, evil. Do you, don't you agree? Here there is a prophet. Here there is Quran. Here there's Allah saying that's good, 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 good. Well done. Like. Give it a like. But excuse me. I thought Allah is just. I thought Allah is merciful. I thought Allah does not harm. I thought Allah does not inflict oppression on people. So what's the fault of that young child to die at the age of 40? He never got married. He never got to live and see this life. Once I mentioned this story to somebody, and he said, when I said this, he said, Wallah, he's lucky he never got married. I said, that's your opinion, mate. Yes? In the idea that when it comes to this, there are, it raises a number of questions, aqaidi questions, misconceptions, objections, shubuhat. If we don't answer, if the member does not address this, then what? We're not doing our jobs. Let's look at this very briefly. Very briefly. Quran tells us that Musa later got his answer. But if you don't think about the answer, you will also not be satisfied. What do we mean? We mean that Allah tells of course, Khidr informs Musa that the reason why this boy was killed was that he will become older and when he becomes older, he will oppress his parents. And Allah did not want that to happen and therefore he took his life away. Okay, but many of you will say, but what's the fault of this boy? Because he hasn't yet done the oppression. So how can Allah punish him before the act? Salamullahi alayka ya amir al-mu'mineen once he saw Abdul Rahman ibn Muljam, this la'een, so Abdul Rahman said to him, Assalamu alayka ya Ali, ya Amir al Mu'mineen. He says, Alaikum assalam. He says, Allah inni uhibbuk. By God, I love you. He says to Amir al Mu'mineen. Amir al Mu'mineen says, Kalla, no, you don't love me. The man says, But I love you. The Imam says, You don't. Three times he repeats it and he walks away. The Sahaba of Amir al Mu'mineen looks at him and says, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, he's telling you he loves you. Why are you telling him that he doesn't? Imam Ali salam says, Innahu laqatiluni, he's going to kill me. I said, no, let's go and kill him before he kills you. He says, how can I punish him before he does the act? Now, we go back to that story. Why is Allah taking the life of this boy before he inflicts the so-called uh, oppression or injustice? Very deep theological question. And I'm going to simplify it. It requires depth. But very briefly, this boy that has died at 14, is he now in Jannah or is he in hell? One person believes in Jannah. And that's absolutely correct. Why should he be in hell? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes him to Jannah. He hasn't done anything wrong, right? Number one. Number two, if Allah had let them live and become an oppressor, Allah does not make anyone do something. There is no jabr. There's no predeterminism in that regard. Otherwise, what's the point of Jannah and Jahannam? People will say, you made me do this. That was the philosophy of Muawiyah, by the way. He'd say, all I'm doing is because Allah forced me, which is nonsense. Now, the point here is what? The point here is Allah would have let him live and at the end he would have died an oppressor. Allah knows because there's no limit to his knowledge and he knew that boy would die a violin. He would go to hell or Jannah. Which one? Hell. So now the boy going to Jannah at 14, is it better for him than to live and go to hell? Which one? 100% is better for him. So now is it an act of punishment or a mercy of Allah? 100% act of mercy. So now, is it a bad thing or a good thing? It's a great thing for the boy. So now, if we're given the choice that we die at age of 14 or we die later and then there is a high chance we go to hell, which one would we choose? If you're sane, you'll say 14. Yes? Now, you might say to me, but why? Shouldn't he have been just died naturally, like many children? Well, if he had died naturally, the story would not be found in the Quran and we would not learn from it. So there would be had, whatever Allah decides to take a life of someone, either by drowning or somebody being killed or dying naturally, the outcome is the same. There is ibrah in it. There is a lesson so that we can pay attention, right? So now, when I look at this, I say, Alhamdulillah, for that child being killed. Why? Because Allah approved it. And Allah is happy with it. And Allah let it happen. So when I say, Alhamdulillah, means, Ya Allah, I'm grateful to you. Praise be to you, yes? Has Allah approved what's happening? The devastation that's happening in Gaza, 35,000 innocent people being killed, yes. 
Did Allah approve the earthquakes and the volcanoes and the natural disasters? Yes. Did Allah approve and let COVID-19 happen? Yes. So what should I be saying? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Allah is happy with it. So who am I to object to it? It's not that I approve of what these oppressors do. No, no. Because if I take you to the 10th of Muharram, you'll understand better. When the La'een, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, said to that lady who's the mountain of patience and the carrier of the flag of Sayyid al-Shuhada after him, How do you think God treated your brother, Hussein? Ma ra'aytu illa jameela. I have not seen except beauty. In Arabic, ma and illa are adatul has, the tools of exclusivity. Zainab said, 10th of Muharram was all beautiful, all of it, everything. Ajeeb. Everything was beautiful. She cried. Her heart was shattered. It's fine. It's fine to be upset because we are human beings. It's fine to be against the dhulm and speak out and stand up against oppression. That's all great. That's not going against Allah, but the heart and what we say regarding this demonstrates whether we are pleased with what Allah is doing or allowing or we are against it. Meaning what? Please understand this. If I want Rabbil Alameen to be pleased with me, I need to understand that there is a plan for me and for everyone else. And this plan is according to the wisdom of Rabbil Alameen. Allah wants a specific journey for me to go through. And everything that he puts me through, I can deal with. Inna Allah, yes? La yukallifu Allah nafsan illa wasaha. Yes, Allah does not burden anyone over which they can withstand. Number one. Number two, everything that happens to me or anyone else is because of something else. Like what? Either to humble us. Like the Prophet of Islam says, If it wasn't for three things, human beings will never lower their head. Poverty, sickness, and death. These have to happen for us to humble ourselves. People think they are top of the world. That could be one reason. Allah wants to humble us. Another reason, It could be because of our doings, our sins. Allah maybe is punishing us for our sins in this world, which is much better than punishing us for our sins in Akhirah because it can't be compared. I'd rather be punished here than in Akhirah. Sometimes it's because to remind us this world is transient. Sometimes it's to highlight the grave action of the oppressors, how bad they are. Sometimes it's because he loves us. He makes us go through pain. إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا famous narration when Allah loves somebody he makes them go through suffering so when I as a believer who understands the Quranic demonstration of Rida I wear the glasses of satisfaction of Allah when I am satisfied with Allah what do I have to do number one I have to be satisfied with whatever he gives me and takes away as far as legislation the will of God which is legislative Secondly, I need to be pleased with the generative will of Allah. What he makes me go through, poverty, health, wealth, society, security. When I see oppression, I need to be, the fact that I need to be pleased with how he is running everything. The moment I complain about God is the moment that I demonstrate I am not happy with him. And I'm not pleased with him. That's one evidence. The moment I don't understand, I don't understand means what? Like I, I say to my friend, you know, I, you know, if God is so just, why is he not stopping these killings? That means I don't understand how things work. I look at it from one lens. A few minutes ago, when I said to you the story of Khidr and Musa, majority here perhaps thought, yeah, that's wrong. But the moment you gain the knowledge, you're thinking it's not that bad after all. It's actually an act of mercy or something good, yes? Now this extra knowledge has given you a wider scope. These holy individuals have wider scopes. They can see beyond. Zainab could see that Karbala will change lives for thousands of years. But Yazid and Ubaidullah did not. Those today who object when it comes to the followers of Ahlul Bayt crying and beating their chest and remembering Karbala, they don't understand that it's not only about history, it's about the present, it's about the future, it's about changing lives, it's about understanding their 
will of God, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how we can submit to it. The point here is that if an individual has vision beyond, beyond the limit that many have, they can see things that will encourage their what? They encourage their patience, but more so satisfaction with Allah. Because finally, I'd say this to you. People say, is it not enough to be patient? Patient means what? Patient means you don't give up. And you say, okay, I'm patient. But your heart is not accepting things. Your heart is still hesitant, right? You just do it or you get on with it because, خلاص, I have to get on with it. Rida is something else. Rida, to attain the satisfaction of Allah, we need to be pleased with Him. And in order to be pleased with Him, I need to have four things, and that's the last thing I'll mention. Four things, please remember these four things. The first, I need to rely on Him through tawakkul. Tawakkul means what? I do something, and I leave everything for Him. Meaning what? i give you an example. God forbid one of us are diagnosed with cancer. And the doctor says, Khalas, you know what? We can try with chemotherapy, but we're not sure. First thing I do is I say, I'm going to rely with Allah through tawakkul, which means I will use medication and whatever I can to save my life. Great. But then I know the cure is from Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Great. Then there is what's known as a thiqatu billah. I trust Him. Trust Him means what? Trust Him means that I. No, if it's good for me to live, he will let me live. But if I don't survive and die, it's actually better for me. That's trusting God. Trusting God means I don't want what is good for me from my lens. I want what's good for me from his lens, which is what matters. That's to trust God, number two. Number three is what? At-tafweedhu lillah. At-tafweedh wa ufawudhu amri ilallah means what? As the Quran says, now, when I've reached a level where I've used the medications and I trust him, I now completely say, I leave everything in his hands. Khalas. Now I leave everything in your hands, Ya Allah. You do whatever you wish. The fourth level is what? Is to be pleased with what he has put me through. Imagine the individual when the doctor tells them you have been diagnosed with cancer. He says, Alhamdulillah. Do we see that? It's hard. It's difficult. It's not an easy thing to say. But that's the right thing if I'm pleased with Allah. Is Allah approving of me in my sickness? Yes. Is Allah has a plan for me? Yes. Once I become satisfied with God, I have reached taslim. Taslim means full, unreserved submission. And that for me is eternal. And that is success that Rabbil Alameen wants us. And you know, once we reach that rida and taslim, what happens? In Surah At-Tawbah, Allah says, In Jannah, the most unbelievable, immaculate feeling of satisfaction is not the physical pleasures. There are many people today, when you ask them, what's the best pleasures of paradise? They'll say to you, the cars, the palaces, the opposite gender, etc., etc. They'll list all the things that they've always wanted, right? Quran says, no, 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 no. These are great. But there's something greater. What is that? min Allahi akbar. The feeling that Allah is pleased with you is much greater. I'll always remember one of my teachers, they, he mentions this hadith to motivate us sometimes when it's hard. He says when an individual, Ahl al when an individual enters Jannah, he gets a letter. He or she gets a letter from Allah. Min al ladhi la yamut il al ladhi la yamut. From the being that never tastes death to the being that shall no longer taste death. I am the one who says to things be and it becomes. Now you have the power to say to things be and it becomes. These are all amazing. But the Quran says Akbar wa Ridwan. Ridwan is an exaggeration of Ridha. When an individual is pleased with Allah, Allah says in, on the day of Qiyamah in Jannah, you'll go through this unbelievable sweet sensation that cannot be described. That's when you feel that Allah is pleased with you. Beyond description of the words. And that's the objective we should be seeking. And that's why Imam Ridha alayhi salam is somebody who is a role model in this path. Why? Because Imam alayhi salam, never in his life did you object to the plan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had for him. Number one. Number two, how much suffering and pain did he go through when his father was in the dungeons for years? Number three, it's not easy. 
to be taken to another city. These are all things we mentioned. But I'll remind you, there is one pain that Imam al-Rida had, which I feel humbly, probably, is the biggest pain. Do you know what that is? To be made and forced to become the heir apparent of al-Ma'mun al-Abbasi. You think, what's wrong with that? When an individual is here to guide mankind and to tell them to walk, to walk towards Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then he's forced to be somebody who is next to an individual who is the manifestation of corruptness and evil on this earth. That's completely shattering for a person. But Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam, for the sake of Allah, for the sake of Muslims, said, okay, I'll do it. You'll do it. But then what did he do? Did he just sulk and say, you know what, khalas. Like some of us do. Well, you know what? I live in a society. Everyone has boyfriend, girlfriend, listens to haram music, does all this. We just have to do what they do. Khalas, you know, with, the, with them. But what can I do? Yusuf, salam Allah, in the, in the uh, palaces of Zulaikha and the, uh, the Aziz, did he just submit to what they wanted despite being in difficult circumstances? Here, Imam al-Ridha uses his position to invite people to Rabbil Alam, to Allah to get them closer to the teachings of the Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt, debates with groups and different scholars, the spreadings and the teachings, to the extent that he stayed in Mashhad only for three years, in Khurasan for three years, until this Ma'moon decided that, you know what, his presence is actually bad for me. Let me end his life. I can't tolerate him being here because he's too much of a positive influence as far as his teachings are concerned. I'm not benefiting from him. He's hurting me. And this is why such individuals do not only talk the talk, but they walk the walk and are great inspirations for you and I. May Allah ta'ala make us of those who follow in their footsteps. May Allah ta'ala help us to attain this unbelievably beautiful, sweet state of rida in our hearts, to be pleased with him. And he, inshallah, will be pleased with us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to visit the shrine of Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam in this world and to attain his shafa'a in akhirah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the souls of all our brothers and sisters who've lost their lives in many different conflicts, including in Gaza and in many other parts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the souls of our ulama who've passed away, including one great scholar who passed away today, Ayatollah Sheikh Ali Qurani in Qom, who passed away today. He has contributed so much works for the advancement of the teachings of the religion of Islam in the school of Ahl al-Bayt. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all Jannah with the barakah of salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.